Today we take for granted the motorways, A roads and city streets, over 2,000 miles of them that form the skeleton road map of Britain. And all because of the Romans, with their ingenuity and dogged determination to conquer everything in their path. I'm Dan Jones and I'm going to retrace the story of our Roman past along six of their most iconic roads. Each road tells the story of our Roman legacy and its rich history. From their very first road across Kent, which powered their invasion, to the vital routes which helped them conquer most of Britain, before being beaten into retreat by the Scots. In nearly 400 years of occupation, the Romans changed Britain forever by bringing their armies, ideas, buildings and religion. But the Romans couldn't have done any of it without one thing, their roads. Sometimes when you're walking or driving around Britain, you'll find yourself on a road that's absolutely ramrod straight. And the chances are that route could have been originally laid down nearly 2,000 years ago by Roman hands, just like Watling Street. Running all the way from the Kent coast to the Midlands and on towards the Welsh borders, Watling Street has two defining features. It was the first road that the Romans built in Britain and at 240 miles, it was also the longest. The story of Watling Street is the story of the Roman invasion. As I travel this road, I'll be able to plot just how the Romans conquered Britain, from the immediate widespread impact of building it to the fierce battles fought along it. 2,000 years ago, Britain was a great prize that had yet to be conquered by the Romans. The Roman Empire lasted for more than 1,500 years. During that time, the Romans invaded southern and eastern Europe and large parts of North Africa. Wherever they went, they took their language, their art, their religion and their government. Now, to keep this massive empire under control, they needed to be able to move their armies about quickly. And to do that, they needed to build roads. Before the Romans launched their full invasion, Julius Caesar came on a scouting mission in 55 BC. He landed with a small force of Romans on the southeast coast of England. Caesar came ashore somewhere around here at Pegwell Bay in Kent. Now, the way he told it, this was a heroic endeavour. Don't forget that in Roman times, Britain was the edge of the known world. Now, in fact, Caesar didn't stay very long, but while he was here, the locals made quite an impression. He wrote, all the Britons paint themselves with a dark blue colour. By this means, they appear more frightening in battle. They have long hair and shave their bodies, all except for their head and upper lip. Groups of 10 or 12 men share their wives in common, particularly between brothers, fathers and sons. Caesar made his mark by establishing trading links with the empire, but the Romans would ultimately return in force. I'm heading to the site of the key Roman invasion, where the story of Watling Street and Britain's Roman road network really begins, Richborough. At the time, it would have been a trading port for the Britons. When the Emperor Claudius sent his invasion fleet in 43 AD, this time, the Romans really meant business. Claudius brought a massive army of four legions and 20,000 auxiliaries. They set sail from the coast of Gaul, that's modern France, and landed at Richborough. This was where the Roman armies gathered as they began their invasion of Britain along a road they were about to build, Watling Street. Dr Andrew Roberts is one of the historians who looks after the ancient Roman remains where the road begins. This is Richborough. It is, it's wet, wet rich. The Richborough site was founded at the time of the Claudian invasion. So, Andrew, we're now standing on the beginning of Watling Street. I mean, it doesn't necessarily look like it. Well, it was a bit grander in Roman times, but it's still pretty impressive today. Um, we're standing on what was effectively a crossroads that sat beneath a monumental arch that towered over Richborough and probably would have been seen for, for some miles away. The Romans were master arch builders. We see them all over the empire. 
The arch on Watling Street might have looked something like this reconstruction. Arches similar to this have been found across Europe. And what's the idea that when people came through this arch, they really knew that they were now entering Roman Britain? Absolutely. Part of the reason why the arch is built here was to mark Richborough as the Accessus Britanniae, the official gateway to Roman Britain. Was Watling Street essential to the success of the invasion? I think, yeah, I think Watling Street was as part of, of, of uh, the, the, the road network that was quickly uh, formalised by the army. So Watling Street is very important for getting uh, men and equipment and supplies further inland to the central parts of, of Britain. And then after that, Richborough becomes a, a port and a town, so it's going to be an important trade route um, for uh, Roman uh, goods coming from well across the empire. As I set off on my journey across the very first Roman road in Britain, it's amazing to think I'll be following the same route taken by Roman emperors, generals and centurions almost 2,000 years ago. As the Romans headed up Watling streets to conquer Britannia, they would have faced difficult journeys on foot or in chariots. As it won't be much fun walking in the pouring rain along the motorway that takes the same route, I'll cover some of this journey by car. From Richborough, Watling Street snakes its way west to Canterbury and then on towards London. It shares a very similar route to what is now the A2. Parts of the road still use the same name. Watling Street would have brought the Romans to the first major obstacle in their invasion plan. I'm now in Rochester, which is about 35 miles from where the Romans landed during their invasion of Britain in the first century AD. And this is a crucial point in the history of Watling Street, because when the Roman army arrived here, they were faced with two major obstacles. The first was an army of native Britons, but the second was the River Medway itself. And crossing it would inspire one of the greatest feats of engineering in the whole history of Roman Britain. After defeating the tribes who were defending the river, it was vital that the Romans found a way to cross the mighty Medway to avoid having to take a massive detour. The crossing of the river had been a major factor in the battle. How did they then go on to make that crossing permanent? Well, the key thing is they build a river crossing and they build the river crossing here in Rochester. So Rochester's here because it's where the Romans decided to cross Watling Street over the river Medway. Do we know how they built the bridge? Maybe the first thing that was here was a bridge of boats. Then maybe a temporary semi-permanent wooden bridge. And finally, when they got their act together, the Romans built these fantastic stone built bridges. And what was so good about this particular position? Uh, it's basically where Watling Street actually hits, literally hits the, the River Medway. And it's a very good bridging point because it's got very firm, uh, it's got a very firm riverbed. How important was this bridge in the history of Roman Britain at large? It's one of the most important bridges in Roman Britain, because remember, Watling Street is the Roman M1. So Watling Street is a major military trunk road. This bridge is a key element along it. Without this bridge, there'd be no Watling Street. Obviously, it was nothing like the modern steel bridge that's here now. It would have looked something like this artist's impression, a stone structure that lasted for hundreds of years, right into the early medieval period, when it was eventually destroyed by river ice. But there's another reason why Rochester is important in the history of Watling Street. In 2016, a great discovery was made in the basement of a shop on the High Street. I've heard that underneath this tattoo parlour, a little bit of Watling Street still survives. Hey, Sebastian. Hey, man. How are you doing? Not bad. So you've got some Roman artefacts downstairs? Yeah, sure. Oh. Sebastian Novatsky has been inking people with anchors, roses and skulls for years. Most of them unaware of what lay beneath his tattoo chair. Oh my god, that's amazing. You've actually got a 2,000 year old Roman road running through the middle of your tattoo shop. How did, um, how did they discover that this was actually here in the first place? Yeah, the builders discovered this and the archaeologists came over and check, and apparently it's 2,000 years old, so... You ever heard of another tattoo shop with a Roman road running under no, it? No, not really, no. I'm the lucky one here. It's crazy that it's down here in the basement of your shop when the high street is, what, like two or three metres above us. Mm -hmm. So I guess in Roman times, the level of the town was just much lower. Yeah, that's apparently the original level of Rochester. 
So do you worry when you're working, you're like going to spill ink on the Roman road? I'm pretty clean when I'm working, so. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, were there tattoos in Roman times? Yeah, it was. Yeah, Romans used tattooing for to mark slaves, just in case they run, run away. They will find out who they belong to. Also, they was using for criminals to tattoo all the crimes on the visible places, like forearms or any visible parts of the bodies to mark their crimes. So it must have really hurt getting a tattoo in Roman times. I mean, what were they using? It's a bone or...? Definitely, they haven't got the equipment we have nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> Probably using some stones. I would imagine they cut the skin and just inject the ink. That's... Do you have to, like, um, take a lot of care to keep keep it in good condition? We, 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 we clean the stones from time to time just because it's a basement so we have quite big humidity. Yeah. So for me it's kind of crazy to think that right here emperors could have passed along this street. You can really see the quality, the brilliance of the engineering. All of these slabs perfectly laid out and incredibly robust and still in use, still standing up to everyday use nearly 2,000 years after they were laid down. And of course what you can also see, even in this very short stretch of Watling Street, is these beautiful parallel straight lines, absolutely characteristic of Roman road building. So I suppose the question is, how did the Romans get their roads so straight? <laughs> I'm uncovering the story behind the great Roman roads that have run the length and breadth of Britain for hundreds of years. My first journey is along 240 miles of Watling Street, the first of their roads in Britain, used by their army to conquer our land. But how did they actually go about building it? To find out, I'm meeting Andrew Hyam, an archaeologist from Leicester University who has studied Roman building techniques. So, Andy, imagine I'm a Roman, it's not too much of a stretch, I know. How do I get my road straight? It's a very simple principle. There's no uh, GPS or anything like that. So long as you've got a good line of sight, if you've got three sticks, you can create a, a straight line. You have your surveyor and you have your assistant. OK. The assistant has all the sticks. Right. The surveyor stands in one place. You set a, uh, a, a, a stake at the far end where you want your, your straight line and you'll get, get your assistant with your direction to lay out the sticks in between. And why did the Romans want their roads to be so straight? Well, firstly, because they could. It's not like a modern road where it has to go around services and villages and towns. They could plough straight on through. But it also makes it the, the shortest line between two, two points. And is this something that was unique to Roman Britain, or did you see it all the way across the Roman Empire? Uh, no, no. I mean, uh, in North Africa, in, in Germany, in France, in Britain, all the sy systems were, were very similar. So uh, one rule generally applied across the whole of the Roman Empire. OK, well, yeah. should we see how it works? I think we should, yes. Well, there you go. Go. I'll, keep, I'll keep that one. All right. The lead surveyor was called an agrimensor. So I guess that makes me the agrimensor's mate. OK, so we're going to build a straight line now for our road from our survey point just here towards that trig point. Right. So if you put up regular intervals, your poles, I'll tell you whether to go to the right or to the left or whether it's straight on. Is it pretty simple? It's that simple. Right. OK, right a bit. Right a bit. Good, good. OK, put one there. When the Romans left Britain in the early 5th century, these simple Excellent. but effective techniques were lost to the Britons they left behind. Left a bit, a bit more. It wasn't until the Middle Ages that we returned to anything like their level of sophistication. OK, right a bit. Good. Keep going, keep going. That way. Perfect. Spot on. We've got a road. We have a road. As well as his simple Roman-style survey poles, Andrew has another piece of Roman road-building technology he wants to show me. So, we've built our Roman road. Now we want to build a town. Streets need to be at right angles. They do. We're Romans and these things matter to us. How do we do it? Still using very, very simple techniques. Nothing complicated, but we need a slightly more uh, advanced piece of kit. All right, so what's in the box? Another elegant piece of Roman surveying equipment, the Groma. Groma. If you want to look after that. It all, it all works again on lines of sight and gravity. 
And this is technology that we know the Romans had? We have evidence of tombstones with pictures of a Roman groma engraved on it. Really? Yes. So the Romans were very proud of this technology, I imagine? They really were. I mean, again, the Romans were experts at taking very simple techniques, standardising it, and using it to very good advantage. And then this is the actual working piece, which fits onto a peg at the top up here. How does it work? Again, as we saw when we were building the Roman road, it's all on lines of sight. So we've got four weights, each in line with each other. So you line these two strings up and you get a straight line that way. I can then turn at 90 degrees, you've got another one. Amazing, isn't it? A piece of kit like this generated a pattern of streets and town planning that we see from right across the Roman Empire, from Britain in the west to Syria in the east. It, it's so, it, I'm always amazed at how simple it is. In the Middle Ages, when understanding of a lot of Roman technology had been lost, people found it hard to believe that humans could have built such long, straight roads. And that's why a lot of sections of Roman road have been nicknamed the Devil's Causeway. To the locals, with no knowledge of forgotten Roman skills, that supernatural explanation could have made sense. These aren't the work of the Devil, they're the work of an agrimensor. Simple but effective techniques like these helped the Romans push Watling Street further across Kent as their invasion and conquest of Britain continue. The towns of Dartford and Bexley Heath now stand on this historic route. And in Bexley Heath, it's now totally blocked by a superstore, so we have to turn off. Around eight miles southeast of central London, the road reaches the high ground at Blackheath and then continues down into the Thames Valley towards the river which means that Watling Street runs straight into the place that's grown to be our nation's capital. Historians are uncertain whether the land was occupied when the Romans arrived, but we do know that at the time it was a marshy area, threaded with small rivers and streams like the River Fleet. They're still there today, but deep underground. Fleet Street runs directly over the ancient watercourse. From this unpromising start, within 20 years the Romans had built a small town, roughly half a square mile in size, with a fortified garrison. Londinium rapidly became a thriving hub, providing road links across Britain and to the larger empire across the Channel. To learn more about the life the Romans created for themselves here, I've come to visit some fascinating Roman remains, buried under the city just north of London Bridge. 2,000 years ago, this site was a temple to Mithras, a Roman fertility god who inspired cult worship. I'm meeting historian Sophie Jackson to find out more about what was uncovered here. When the Roman armies used roads like Watling Street to colonise a place, they carried a lot of baggage with them. So this is an amazing display. What is it all? Um, well, this is a very small sample of the many, many thousands of finds which were excavated um, when the Bloomberg building went up. Um, there are about 600 objects in this case, so there were 14,000 back in the uh, back in the store. So everything that we can see here came out of the ground under our feet? Yes, yeah. Gosh, that's incredible. Is the amazing richness of, of all of this stuff to do with the fact that so many Roman roads connected through London? Yes, I mean, the reason London is here is, is for a reason of transport logistics. It's, it's the first place up the sort of Thames estuary that the river could be crossed and that there was enough dry ground to either side and suitable ground to build a road network. And, you know, where we are, we're, we're probably not more than 30, 40 metres from Roman Watling Street, which was one of the major thoroughfares. Goods are coming up to the Thames, they're, they're being unloaded in the ports and then coming out of London to sort of feed the conquest of Britain. Tell me about some of the most intriguing ones, do you? Ah, well, there's so, so much to say. I mean, probably one of the most significant finds from the site were the um, Roman wooden writing tablets. Um, they don't normally survive because wood, they're made of quite thin wood and it normally rots, but this site was very waterlogged. Water normally keeps out oxygen, which causes decay. Um, we've got some examples of whole ones, but this, this little fragment here is, is particularly um, interesting. Oh, you it's, can still see writing on it. Yeah, oh. and it's actually scratched on the outside. So this is the address that would have been on the outside of the tablet. And it says Londinio Magontio, and it's the earliest address in London. It, basically, it says to Magontius yeah. in London. 
this is probably um, certainly one of, if not the earliest reference to London in history. That's anywhere. amazing. This tablet has been dated to around AD 65, and it's just one of thousands of fascinating finds. We have some finds which were associated with the military, Roman military, so we have oh, yeah. um, four iron spearheads. And we also have quite a few bits and pieces of, of Roman armour. Um, oh, yeah. When you think of Roman armour, you think of sort of really impressive bits of metal, but these are all the many, many sort of straps and hinges um, which we use to fix all the different pieces of armour. What all these artefacts tell us is who's coming to London in the first few years, um, where people are coming from, you know, from Gaul, um, modern France, from, from Germany, um, from Italy, not surprising. And then gradually, as we go up through time, we see more of the sort of gradual Romanization of the, of the native British people who are here. So we see people copying Roman wares, copying, um, you know, the style of brooches change, the style of pottery changes and so on. So Watling Street was the driving force behind the Roman expansion into the new province. Because of it, London became a hub, and the invaders built more roads to intersect with it. Stain Street, Ermine Street and Portway. But historians have a problem. It's hard to trace the route of Watling Street through London, and no one's quite sure where it goes after it disappears at Southwark, back there, before it re-emerges just north of Hyde Park. Some historians believe it travelled through the city of London, the route of Cheapside, Holborn and Oxford Street. While others believe it crossed the Thames at Westminster. It's thought there was a ford here 2,000 years ago. And to add to the mystery, there's another Watling Street near St Paul's. But it's totally unrelated. It's a version of the medieval Etheling Street, meaning Street of Princes. Whichever route it takes, we pick it up again a mile or so away at the western end of Oxford Street, right near Marble Arch. Despite appearances, the arch is not Roman, but a Victorian homage, an old gateway to Buckingham Palace that was shifted here in the 1840s. I'm standing on the Edgware Road, the modern-day A5, and it's the perfect example of how Britain's Roman road network is still in use today. Now, it might not look much like it, but this is Watling Street. From here, the road goes all the way through northwest London and then on 150 miles to Shropshire. And there's plenty to see along the way. As Watling Street leaves London, it heads north through the suburbs towards the Hertfordshire town of Radlett. It's a stretch of the A5 that is still known by the ancient name. Now, this section of Watling Street is important because it runs through a region that gives the road its name, although that dates to a long time after the Romans left. A Saxon tribe known as the Wacklingas once lived around here. Their territory was known as the Wacklinger Castor. By the 9th century AD, the road they used was known as Wackling Street, or as we call it today, Watling Street. We don't know what names the Romans used for any of their roads in this country. We know that back home in Italy, they had legendary streets like the Via Appia. But the names in Britain date from long after the Romans left. Throughout the medieval period, the name Watling Street was applied to the entire route, all 240 miles of it, running from the Kent coast to Shropshire. By travelling along Watling Street, the first Roman road built in Britain, I'm investigating the Roman invasion and occupation of Britain in the first century AD. This road was used to carry their armies into the heartland of what they knew as Britannia. So far I've covered around 100 miles, from the Kent coast to Hertfordshire, roughly halfway. I'm on my way to the next major site along the route, which began as a vital staging post for the invading army. I'm walking along Watling Street in the direction of St Albans, which is just up ahead. Now, nearly 2,000 years ago, St Albans was known as Verulamia. It grew up along this street to become one of the largest and most prosperous towns in Roman Britain. We're thousands of miles from Italy, but like all their occupied territories in Europe, the Romans were keen to make this new town feel just like home. Verulamium had buildings such as a theatre, houses with underfloor heating and beautiful mosaic floors, just like Rome itself. This remarkable town was discovered and excavated in the 1930s, and I'm meeting David Thorold, curator of the Verulamium Museum, to discover what makes it so unique. 
If this was Roman times, where would we be standing now? We're just at the gateway into the entrance to the town. So if you're traveling out of London along Watling Street, this is where you'd approach the town from. And what we have here are the foundations of the gateway as you entered into the town. Can you give me a picture of what this would have looked like? What we would have seen here is basically two entranceways through the middle of uh, a gateway, which would allow the carriages and vehicles to come inside and out. And then on the outside, we have a gate, a tower, which would be uh, framing the building. And then over the top, we'd be looking at a crenellated walkway and guard posts on it. So is this primarily for security or was it just to impress people as they arrived? It's probably a bit of both, to be honest. So it was made to look impressive to people from London as they approached. So when the Romans arrived here, what did they find? Was this already a town? Kind of. We're in a sort of shallow valley here with a, a, a marshy river and Verulamium seems to have developed as a crossing point on the uh, river for trade purposes. And how were the Romans received? I mean, were they welcomed or was there a lot of hostility and antagonism? Well, that is interesting because the local tribe were on very friendly terms with the Romans didn't oppose their presence and may indeed have been helping them out. So it, it looks very strongly like the local tribe uh, decided that they were actually uh, better off being part of the empire than opposing it. By 50 AD, Verulamium had been granted the rank of municipium, meaning its citizens had official protection. The town soon benefited from Roman influence. David, what am I looking at here? This is a very nice example of a Roman mosaic. So this mosaic was once part of what sounds to me like a very plush property. Absolutely. This is an extremely wealthy townhouse for a rich citizen of Verulamium. Do we know where the craftsmen came from who made a mosaic like this? If this wasn't native technology to Britain? Well, we think it probably was. Um, certainly by the time these mosaics are going down, uh, the Romans have been here for many generations. and. Uh, what we seem to be looking at is a local producer uh, who is um, designing and laying most of the mosaics in the region. Mosaics were common in ancient Greece, so the Romans were adopting someone else's idea, as they so often did. Created from thousands of tiny tiles, mosaic making was highly skilled work. They often featured gods, animals and complex geometric designs, and they were high-value status symbols for any Roman who wanted to show off to the neighbours. And did the wealth of Verulamium and houses like this depend on Watling Street? Being on Watling Street, you're on one of the main arteries of the Roman Empire, so we may be out in the um, sticks in the province of Britain, but you are linked to all the other towns in the Roman Empire. Um, and Verulamium has an advantage in that it is very close to the port of Londinium. So we have a lot of business passing through. So you have merchants passing through the town, you have traders passing through, lots of buying and selling going on, and you've got goods going back out the other way as well. So it's a, it's a vital link in, in the, the business of empire. The locals in St Albans might have been compliant with this Romanisation, but northeast of here, there was a tribal queen who wasn't convinced that buddying up with the Romans was a good idea. Boudicca was queen of the Iceni tribe who came from Anglia, and she wanted revenge against the Romans for the way they'd treated her lands and her people. Boudicca's husband was king of the Iceni tribe, and when he died, the Romans forcibly seized his land, flogged Boudicca and raped her daughters. She wanted revenge. She rallied like-minded tribes and together they went on a killing spree across eastern Britain. Now the Roman historian Tacitus described what happened. He says, the whole island rose in arms under the command of Boudicca. They hunted down the Roman troops in their scattered posts, stormed the forts and assaulted the colony itself, which they saw as the seat of their enslavement. Nor did the angry victors deny themselves any of the savagery characteristic of barbarians. Boudicca turned the Romans' own roads against them and used them to travel south from her homeland. First, she attacked and destroyed the Roman city of Camulodunum, now Colchester, and then their capital, Londinium. 
Leaving London in ruins, Boudicca's army continued their uprising and travelled northwest up Watling Street to Verulamium. The elegant town centre was burned to the ground and hundreds of citizens were slaughtered, but Boudicca still wasn't finished. Leaving Verulamium as a smoking ruin, she headed further north with her army to face her biggest battle yet, the Battle of Watling Street. Boudicca's army came face to face with around 10,000 Roman legionaries travelling in the opposite direction. The soldiers were commanded by the general Paulinus, who had recently put down a Druid uprising in North Wales. I'm close by Watling Street, not far from the place where Boudicca's army fought the Romans. Now, because of that uprising, the Romans built a string of defensive forts here. I've come to explore a site built on the remains of one of them. Taking a slight detour from Watling Street, I'm heading to the Warwickshire village of Badgington, near Coventry. It's the site of Lunt Fort, built in the time of the first Roman invasion, around 60 AD. It stayed in use for 20 years. The site was rediscovered by archaeologists in the 1930s and was partially rebuilt in the 1970s on the original foundations. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? I'm all right, thank you. Thanks for braving the weather. Richard Brooks is a Roman expert here. What is this place? That's a good question. Uh, we're standing in uh, what we call a gyrus, which is from the Greek word for circle. Um, this is the only structure of its kind that's ever been discovered anywhere in a Roman fort, anywhere in the empire. So we think this is a cavalry training ring. Because wow. the Lunt was built at the height of the Boudican Revolt, either just before or just after the climactic battle of Watling Street against Boudicca. I feel pretty confident in saying this wasn't built in Roman times. Oh, definitely not. When, when was it built? It was built in the 1970s by 31 base squadron, the Royal Engineers. They built everything that we can see, the granary, the gyrus that we're standing in, and the gateway, in the same way, and using the same methods and materials as the Roman soldiers would have done 2,000 years previously. So no chainsaws or cranes or earth movers. And even for people like the Royal Engineers who are pretty skilled at building things, it was quite a difficult job. What else would have been at the fort? Well, we think it was quite a modestly sized fort. The idea was, was to uh, use the Lunt to basically keep an eye on the locals and make sure they didn't cause any more trouble. What happened when the Romans did realise what was happening with Boudicca's revolt? Well, they made all haste to uh, bring battle to Boudicca, um, but it was, it was a very rushed, very... Um, it wasn't perfect conditions for the Romans because they were caught napping, they had to make up ground. They might have been rushed, but they had a strategy. Boudicca's army was much bigger than that of Paulinus, so he had to seize the advantage. He did it by forcing the battle to take place in an area that was hemmed in by forest. This meant the Britons couldn't outflank or overwhelm the Romans, and so they were forced to take them head on. And there was no one better at fighting in formation than the Roman legions. Boudicca's army was destroyed. The revolt was over. What happened to Boudicca? All that we can be certain of is that she died at the point of the, the end of the Boudican uh, revolt, but we don't know the circumstances. It was suggested that she took ill and died. She could have fallen in the battle itself, or she could have drunk poison uh, to kill herself rather than being caught and punished, taken to Roman chains by the Romans. So I don't think we'll ever be certain of that either. The locals were clad in skins and cloth, but what was the equipment that gave the average Roman soldier his advantage? Richard has roped in a friend, George, to help show me. This is the standard uniform in the first century in the Roman Empire. Um, can I try it on? Oh yes. What yeah, goes first? Uh, I put the tunica on first. What's this made out of? Uh, it's made of wool, okay. which is uh, widely well, available. Well, yeah, sort of uh, locally made. They started to wear what we refer to as kind of these short breeches. Um, okay. Initially, when the Romans encountered uh, tribes, people like the Iceni, like the, uh, the native Britons, and they were wearing trousers, they dubbed them feminalia, because yeah. they thought it was effeminate to wear trousers. Well. Men should run around essentially wearing a skirt. I think we need something for your, uh, your neck. We need a nice scarf. Oh, thank you very much. So this is just round my neck, like an ordinary round scarf? Round your neck, yeah. uh, okay. a bit like a neckerchief. Um, sort of cravat style. A little bit. Um, this is to stop your, um, your neck 
without being chafed by the leather thong that keeps your helmet on. You see, and stick your head in as well. That's the way, Optima. There we are. Optima? Optima, very good. Heavy on the shoulders. Mm. When we put uh, your next item on, your belt, you will find that a lot of the weight that's on your shoulders now will go onto your hips and it will be even more comfortable. Strap for your sword, it's mounted onto your, your beltius. Okay, right. Now breathe in, soldier. There we are. And I need to need to protect my head, I suppose. I'd say that's probably a good idea. So this, uh, we refer to it as a gallia. A gallia, why is that? Uh, so called because the, the rough basic design of it is very similar to uh, helmets that uh, Gaulish tribes in Gallia were using. So modern France, right? Modern France. The Romans weren't above taking ideas that they thought worked from conquered tribes and uh, basically making them slightly better. Your sword, your gladius, the full title for that is Gladius Hispaniensis. Now, because you're an auxilia, uh, what you have here is your typical auxiliary shield. This uh, we refer to as a clippius. Clippius. Uh, it's from, uh, we think it's from a Greek term. So it covers you pretty much from head to toe, especially if you get into a fighting stance. Next, it's time for the main event, the Great Sword. The Gladius is primarily a stabbing weapon. It's optimised for that. It's got a very nasty, sharp, tapered point. Yes. The thing about the way the Romans fought was they were all very close together, going yeah. forward towards the enemy. And if you were to swing a sword about and slash it and swing it when you're really close to everyone, mm -hmm. you'd be fighting each other. Exactly. You don't want to kill your own teammates. Mm -hmm. So you would thrust forward with it. And the good thing about that is not only are you not endangering the soldiers on either side, but you keep your shield in front of you to protect yourself yeah. at the same time. So you're really hard to kill. You're defending yourself and you're attacking at the same time. Well, this is what Boudicca's warriors experienced in the Battle of Watling Street. They were forced into a narrow defile where their long chopping swords uh, counted for pretty much nothing and they just got in each other's way. So the Roman infantry who were used to fighting close and in a brutal fashion could just go to work. Boudicca's revolt may have been quashed on Watling Street, but the war between the Romans and the native Britons raged on. Many of the tribes who lived here didn't take kindly to being controlled by a foreign power. So Roman legions spent decades putting down rebellions in Wales, Yorkshire, the southwest, and Wales again. It took the Romans more than a century before they could claim that they truly ruled Britannia. My journey along Britain's longest and oldest Roman road, Watling Street, has taken me on a truly revealing route. Starting at the Kent coast in the southeast, I've travelled more than 200 miles across the heart of England, retracing the steps of the Roman invasion of Britain in 43 AD. Watling Street was the trunk road that enabled the Romans to push their conquest across the length and breadth of the land. And nearly 2,000 years ago, it came to an end here, a place that for the Romans really was the end of the earth. This is Roxeter in Shropshire, which the Romans called Viriconium. Now, like many places in the first century AD, it started life as a Roman legionary fortress, but a civilian settlement grew up around it and soon it was a bustling city. From here, there were roads and trackways that branched out into North Wales and further north to Hadrian's Wall and beyond. But historians agree that Roxeter marks the end of the line for Watling Street. Cameron Moffat is the curator of collections here, with expert knowledge of how the Romans and the British combined to become something new. So this is part of what was once then a very busy Roman town. Why did the Romans have a town here? Um, it's very much to do with Watling Street uh, and, and access to the important ports and the important places in the, in the far southeast. And uh, Roxeter really is effectively the terminus for Watling Street. After the Romans arrive here in the mid first century, we've got a military base, but it quite quickly turns into a civilian settlement. It does. I mean, first of all, you've got your, uh, your military establishment and there will have been settlements of local people on the peripheries. What happens is by the 80s AD, the military has moved on. They've conquered North Wales, they've moved the, uh, the legion up to Chester, and they don't need this for military purposes anymore. And what they do is they hand it over to the local tribe, the, the Cornovii, and they say, okay, here you go, make this into a town, and then we can come and charge you loads of tax. 
Tell me about this arch. It's absolutely enormous, isn't it? This piece of masonry is called the Old Work, and it's been called that for a few hundred years now. And this is what survives of the Basilica. Uh, and this was an enormous exercise hall where people came and worked up a sweat. Like and, a gym? A gym, exactly, and uh, the, the, with, with a few more functions as well. And it was very tall. Really, you could have seen this for many miles around. So this was an exercise hall. What else was going on here? Um, you would get uh, little traders who would might be selling snacks, they might be offering to do your hair. If you've come and you've done your exercise, worked up a sweat, you cannot move on through what was a set of double doors into the bath suite where you would then continue the whole process, um, going through cool rooms and then into warm rooms, having a slave scrape you down uh, to get rid of the, uh, all the nasty sweat. We're not in Pompeii, so I assume that wasn't buried. This has been standing since the Romans left it. That has been standing since the Romans left it, and it's, it's really a tribute to the, 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 you know, their building techniques and the strength of their mortar. And those enterprising locals weren't averse to grabbing a bit of Roman luxury for themselves. Cameron's about to show me a reconstruction of the underfloor heating beneath the bathhouse. It sounds like a very modern idea. And so this was the hypercost, so what happened here? Well, where we are standing now, we are below floor level, below Roman floor level. And this is where the heated air that was generated by an enormous furnace down at the far end of the building, this is how it moved underneath the floors and then came up into individual rooms through vents like we can see over there. So this is the famous Roman underfloor heating? This is it. Was bathing something particularly Roman, or would it have been familiar already to the local tribespeople? Well, bathing in this way, with all these elaborate facilities, this was definitely Roman. But I think it was um, appreciated by people wherever the Romans went. This is sort of the last bathhouse on Watling Street, if you like. Would there have been a sense that this was a frontier town, you know, end of civilization, if you like, for the Romans, or, or not? You know, the Romans, they got everywhere. And, uh, but th this was the, the place in this part of the country where you had all the facilities that you could possibly need. Um, and in addition to the, the baths, um, there was a, a huge forum over the other side of Watling Street um, where you would have the authorities and legal services and um, everything is concentrated here. What started out as a military invasion in 43 AD, less than 100 years later, had resulted in a new kind of civilization, one in which the Romans and the Britons were living side by side. This wasn't just about rest and relaxation for Roman soldiers struggling through a harsh British winter. This was built by and for the local British population, enjoying all the comforts of Roman civilization here at the end of Watling Street. The road that was built for invasion and conquest, whose story is littered with bloody battles with native Britons, eventually reached its end in a town where the Romans and the Britons found themselves forced to live in harmony and share cultures and even bathtubs.